clear, bold, and concise. You are listening to Stark Hour at StarkHour.com on Liberty News Radio. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the second hour of the Stark Hour. Well, folks, for the second hour, we like to talk about homesteading and self-sufficiency. Today we have Judy Dollarhite, who has grown up as a daughter of a farmer, and who her and her husband John have practiced farming and homesteading for the last 27 years. Judy, how are you today? I'm well. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Uh, the last time you were on the show, I got lots of compliments, Judy. Uh, people said you... Uh, articulate very well so who well, better to you. have who better to have back on the show and talk about the subject than you so what we want to talk about today is uh, some of the things with concerning raising animals and the homesteading uh, side of things so we want to talk about what type are the easiest the pros and the cons of different types uh, which produce the most food versus the amount of food they consume and which are the easiest to process. We will also talk about what you can raise on a small homestead, such as an acre, and what you can raise on a larger one with multiple acres. What kinds of regulations you might be faced with, and other things like that. Let's get started. Judy, I believe you have experienced most of the things I have mentioned here. Let's start with the types of animals that you would uh, consider to be a good choice for a small homestead, let's say, you know, an acre. I would say rabbits and chickens, quail, possibly goats if, you, if you've if you got the right acre. It, it kind of varies depending on how, how your land lays and what kind of vegetation you have. But those types of animals work out very well, and we've raised all of those at some point. Um, we have three acres, so we have a little bit more to work with. Um, we raise our own beef um, one at a time. Uh, we don't keep more than that. We've had several goats in the past. Um, the the goats and the rabbits, the benefit to those, they're small. They're less expensive than some of the larger animals, and they make the best manure for gardening. There is nothing better than goat and rabbit manure. It's a cold manure. It's ready to use. I've literally planted in nothing but a bucket of rabbit manure and had wonderful plants. So those benefits are are just second to none for your gardening. Now I, I've uh, kind of dabbled in rabbits. I don't know near what you know about rabbits, but uh, I, I know when I was raising, um, you, you can raise a lot of green stuff for uh, like, what is it, the the duck lily and stuff like that that rabbits duckweed, duck yes. yeah. And yes. if you put their manure in the water, it actually feeds that duckweed and it just grows like crazy. That's that's pretty common to do that, right? It is. Uh, a lot of folks do the duckweed with aquaponics with the fish. I wouldn't want to use the manure in the in the water with the fish. I I would probably just use the manure outside with with the gardening. The duckweed works well with aquaponics. Um, we've actually bought some things to get ready to do the aquaponics, but we haven't got our full greenhouse and our tanks and everything. With that, the regulations, there are a few regulations with the aquaponics in Missouri. Um, you, If you use tilapia, which is typically in our climate, that's the most desirable fish to use. You do have to get a permit and be inspected by the conservation department. Having the situation that, that we've had with the government and regulations, I would choose not to do that. I don't want to be inspected. I don't want to be regulated. I want to be left alone because it's a non-native species. That's why they get involved. If you use catfish or bluegill, you, you don't have those, reg or goldfish, you don't have those types of regulations. Wow. And back to the rabbits. Now, rabbits produce a lot of uh, meat and, and they they reproduce very quickly. Is yeah. it easy to say that someone could easily uh, sustain themselves um, off for, with the meat off of rabbits alone? You could ra you can raise an awful lot of rabbits in a couple of months. If you've got four four does, say, and and one buck, you could you could raise an awful lot of meat. Uh, for a family in, in that amount of time. There there are some breeds that are better than others. Um, 
big does not always mean better. A lot of folks get into the Flemish giants thinking those great big rabbits are, are just the way to go. There's an awful lot of bone in a Flemish. Their temperament's good, which is kind of important to me. I don't like to be torn to pieces. But but the butcher ratio of meat to bone, um, it, it's not as good. We're we're pretty stuck on the New Zealand whites or the Californias or a cross of the two. Those are typically very available and and accessible and not very expensive for the amount of food that you put in them. The the butcher weight is very good. They're a fast grower. They're they're little eaters. They are just little eater machines. And they grow and produce a really good product in a shorter amount of time. Now, have you written a, a, a book or um, some kind of a guide on raising rabbits? I haven't written a guide. I did write a book um, going down the multi-million dollar rabbit hole. That was outlining our situation with the USDA when they were trying to fine us $6.19 million. Wow. I didn't include anything in regard. I talk about it a little bit of of the do's and don'ts, but I really didn't. I haven't written a guide. There's a couple that are available um, on Amazon, and and a lot of times those free ebooks. There's several that I've read that are really good that I don't know that I could improve upon. Um, I don't always agree. Um, the USDA guidelines. Um, there's some things they want you to do that are really not advantageous to you as the farmer, and not not for the rabbit. Now. Nest- Go ahead, I'm sorry. Nest boxes are one thing that USDA wants to heavily regulate, and they're wrong. The people that write those regulations haven't put it into practice or they wouldn't recommend. They're all hung up on a metal nest box. Well, in the summertime, the rabbits cook, they get very hot, and and you don't have a good outcome. In the winter, they're extremely cold, and you have frozen popsicle rabbits. If you use a wooden nest box, yes, you might have to change the bottom more often. You might have to throw it away or sand it or or clean it up or whatever. But that wood acts as a really good insulator against the heat and the cold, and you don't have frozen or or cooked rabbits. That's just one example that they're really picky on those things. But my experience is you want a wooden nest box. I assume that uh, rabbits chew and... and, uh eat on things a lot, so you have to kind of watch the other types of materials you would use as well. That's true, but honestly, I haven't. we haven't experienced a whole lot of chewing on the nest boxes. And, and if you have a rabbit that's a particular, you know, chewer, you can throw in a scrap piece of wood, and, and they typically go after that rather than the nest box. We, we, re, we really don't have a problem with that. Okay. So one of the, uh, the things with uh, rabbits... As far as raising them, what resources do you would you recommend then to read? Do you have any that you recommend for someone getting started? No, I don't okay. I, I would if someone's just getting started. Your local, if you have a small animal swap meet, go and talk to those families that are selling rabbits and and raising them, and pick their brain. Ask them what works, what doesn't. Often, you can request to come out and look at their setup most farmers are pretty open and and very willing to let you come and look and you can kind of see a a difference in in how certain people do things and what works best Um, we do have a a supply house in missouri um, that is in monette it is called bass supply b-a-s-s they have a wonderful showroom Um, the problem with it is it's kind of geared toward commercial commercial operations, their products are are pretty expensive if you buy a ready-made cage, but they also sell the wire, and it's a good place to go and get ideas on what you can build for yourself. They have very sophisticated um, manure catchment systems and and flushing systems and watering systems and those types of things, and and they have the, the wire with the baby saver. I don't know if you're familiar with that. It's a smaller gauge wire so the babies don't roll out of of the cage if they get knocked out of the nest box. I would highly recommend that, that at least for your does that you have a, a baby saver wire for your doe cages. That's excellent. I I am looking into this because it's definitely something that I want to include in some of the things that I'm doing with homesteading. Mm-hmm. I have uh, 
have have seen a couple operations, and of course, I have uh, definitely um, looked into uh, some of the uh, cages and the types of uh, things out there. But um, mm-hmm. and I think I talked to you and John about it a little bit too, um, especially looking into where to as where to keep them to make sure that they're out of the heat and to make yeah. sure that you have a, a good insulation for them. Mm-hmm. I'm definitely going to look into them and uh, implement them into my homesteading practices, but uh, I think I'm probably a few months off on that. One of the things that uh, we're going to get into here after break, Judy, that I want to talk to you about is um, some of the regulations that a person might be faced with uh, regarding um, uh, raising animals and, and uh, rabbits and things of that nature. Uh, mm-hmm. You know all too well some of the regulations that a person runs into. So after break, we'll get to that and, uh, and we'll get right back to you. There are many water filters to choose from, but there is only one system that is consistently customer rated five stars as the number one system for effective filtration of fluoride, radiation, drug residues, heavy metals, a wide range of radioisotopes, and more. Introducing the Pure Effect Ultra, the next generation water filter that also raises alkaline pH, improves antioxidant potential, and has advanced anti-radiation technology all while using no electricity. Sold worldwide, it provides virtually instant clean water on demand. It is not made in China and the shipping is free to all 50 states. Buy your Pure Effect Ultra today by visiting pureeffectfilters.com or call 888-891-4821. Again, that's 888-891-4821 or visit pureeffectfilters.com. The word vigor is defined in the dictionary as health and strength in body and mind. Do you have enough health and strength in body and mind? Would you like to pursue life with passion? Would you like to know where you stand when it comes to your vigor score? That's right. There's a free scientific test you could take now that will help you find out what your vigor score is. Then you can do things to improve that score. Did you know that? It's absolutely free, F-R-E-E, free. All you got to do is get a hold of Kurt Crosby. You can do so, C-U-R-T, that's Kurt, C-U-R-T at libertyroundtable.com. Or call Kurt at 801-669-2211. That's 801-669-2211. Would you like to learn about the scientifically proven vigor test? It's free. How would you like to improve your vigor score? Again, inexpensive solutions are available now. Call Kurt Crosby at 801-669-2211. Or Kurt, C-U-R-T, at LibertyRoundTable.com for your free Vigor Score test today. Clear, bold, and concise. You are listening to Stark Hour at StarkHour.com on Liberty News Radio. Ladies and gentlemen, we're back from break and we're with our guest Judy Darheit talking about homesteading uh, with the types of animals a person can raise on a large and a small homesteading um, scenario and we were just left our last segment talking about the types of regulations one might be faced with when uh, raising animals and Judy knows all too well about regulations especially with rabbits I believe right Judy that's correct of course if you live in city limits most of them have uh, a lot of restrictions um, that make it really difficult to homestead but what about county and state regulations are there regulations um, that we have to follow with county and state there are and every county is different every every state will probably be different i i can only speak from missouri and christian county because that's where i've lived my entire life i i can tell you that as far as county there's not as many probably in Christian County because we're a rural area to begin with, but it doesn't mean that it's not there. Um, various subdivisions and areas, even though I'm in the county, we still have a few restrictions where I live. Um, we're not allowed to have any pigs. Um, we're not allowed to have dog kennels, but nothing else is spelled out in any of our covenants um, with, within our subdivision. The county has various things, and then, of course, the state um, in regard to rabbits, um, meat rabbit production, if you're producing meat rabbits for human consumption, the state doesn't become involved until you reach a 1,000 head a year. 
So unless you're, and that's a lot of rabbits for a homesteading operation. So that probably in Missouri wouldn't be a concern for most people. But every locale is different. So do your homework. I wouldn't necessarily draw attention to yourself, but you might go into your to your county, and typically the health department would be the location that you would go and ask if there's regulations on for county in regard to raising of animals and, and ask for that sheet of information. And if not your health department, they should be able to direct you wherever else you would need to go. And it wouldn't hurt to get on your state.gov, your your agriculture.gov for your state and and do some looking in regard to a particular animal or even species of animal that you are looking into raising. You said uh, something that if you were raising it uh, for meat, there are not regulations, but if you're raising it for pets, there are regulations? You better believe it. If If for rabbits, if you are over $500 a year gross income, now you fall into the category of having to be licensed with USDA, and that's what bit us. Even though we had contacted USDA prior to raising one single rabbit, we were advised, which is what we started with, is meat rabbits. We don't regulate rabbits. That's deemed poultry, and we don't deal with that. But they never told me that they dealt with it as pets. Who would think that they regulate they don't regulate a rabbit you put in your body for human consumption, but they do regulate one you put on your lap as a pet. I don't even understand That's, the logic behind that. Well, there's not any, and often with with government there isn't any logic in it, and and that's what what caught us, and and I wouldn't want to see that to happen to anyone. And and in regard to the aquaponics, a lot of people don't realize that that the tilapia is regulated, so it you really want to check not only the t- the type of animal but also the species because there may be some little something somewhere that you're not aware of and you don't want to go down the road that we did because it made a very old woman out. Yeah, I'm sorry to hear about that. One of the things that you had mentioned too that uh as far as regulating rabbits now if you're if you're raising the rabbit for your own consumption, how can the FDA get involved in that? The USDA. Or USDA, they, yes. They really don't, um, unless unless you sell to someone and you sell regularly. A lot of people that raise meat rabbits also sell to Pelfries. Um, that is a company in Arkansas. They they use them for various purposes. Medical research. A lot of the products that that make up cosmetics, shampoo, soaps, all of those things are typically tested in a laboratory on rabbits. Now, Pelfries is very specific on the type of rabbit. They want an all-white rabbit with a pink eye, which is a a New Zealand white or a Florida white. Typically, those are the two breeds that that you would see at a Pelfries facility. But a lot, you also have contracts if you contract with those folks. And so you, you will be watched and you will be under contract typically with them. And if you sign a contract that you will not sell to anyone else, that can run into some problems. Now, for your own human consumption, typically, if you're doing it just for your family, you're not bothered. But if you sit on a sidewalk or you advertise in Craigslist or any of the other animal or in the newspaper, Don't be surprised. There are USD agents out there lurking, looking for someone that is ignorant of the law, and and they will come and and make your life really difficult. I think the proper thing would be to do is just to come and say, hey, are you aware of this? And uh, we just want to inform you of this so that you can make sure that you uh, are compliant or whatever they expect of you, rather than come and uh, bring the axe down on you on the first time. I just don't understand if they're there to help us and they're there for our own well-being and they're there to serve us why are they so set on trying to entrap people and catch them that just doesn't make sense unfortunately usda is not what it what it is what it was designed for it used to be probably in our grandparents generation even it was more of a an educational program here are new farming methods here are new innovations here's a new fertilizer or here's a new piece of equipment Um, here's a piece of equipment maybe you can't afford to purchase, but we have it and you can rent it or lease it. Anymore, it's more of a heavy regulatory rather than an educational 
type of agency, and it's gotten out of hand as most government programs have. Fortunately, you have to ask the question, and I'm not saying that this is the way it is. I'm just saying I ask the question and wonder if it just sometimes doesn't seem like some of these agencies and the regulations just aren't designed to put the small guy out of business and cause the uh, the corporate farms and stuff to be able to prosper and take over. Absolutely. So I mean, absolutely. That, that's just that's that that's very shocking. And something that I think uh, we need to look into and see about uh, preserving the uh, the small independent farms. So one of the things that um, we had talked about, you talked about the rabbits and raising the rabbits and goats on a small. Is there any other uh, animal that you would recommend on like a small homestead type uh, situation? Well, we we in the last year or six months have got into quail, and those are some very prolific little critters. They We have some hens that are producing more than one egg a day. And of course, they're very tiny, but they're also very nutritious. And they are, I haven't had a molting period with our hens like you do with chickens. And actually, I have trouble getting rid of and finding ways to, to utilize all of the eggs. And sometimes it ends up being compost. But uh, they are very prolific layers, and the incubation period, they don't sit like a hen well. You will have to incubate the eggs in an incubator, but in 17 days, you have baby quail. So wow. they're, it's a fast turnaround, and they grow very fast. It's amazing what a week does between a hatchling and a week, week-old um, chick. Do you get that much meat off of a, a quail? I mean, is this something that will feed one person in a meal, or does it take two of them? Or? Well, we're big meat eaters, so for us it takes two. Uh, for for a smaller meat appetite, one would probably serve a lot of people, but my husband probably eats three, actually, and, and I eat two. But they are um, very easy to keep. Um, they don't take a lot of space. Wow. And you do get a fast turnaround time, and, and the eggs are the added benefit. Uh, they are messy. You you really have to get really creative with the feed. They, well, they Judy, we got a, a hard lot. break we got to take care. We'll get right back to that subject. Can hold that thought, please? You're listening to Liberty News Radio. Imagine a school where faith and integrity are at its center, where heritage and responsibility instill character, where educating both hearts and minds brings about academic excellence. There is a school in American Fork where character and embracing the providence of a living God are fundamental, where students' national test scores average near the 90th percentile. Based on LDS principles and a love of country, now in our 39th year, American Heritage School is accepting fall enrollment for kindergarten through high school. What would you do for your child? Give them an education that will prepare them for life. Located east of the temple in American Fork, American Heritage School is a remarkable and affordable alternative. Visit us, find us online, or in the yellow pages. American Heritage School in American Fork. Liberty is not free. Its costs are innumerable. Without monetary funding, the valiant efforts of freedom-loving Americans become diminished or outright defeated. We present a solution, the Give Me Liberty Fund. The plan is quite simple. Invite individual Americans to contribute less than a dollar a day. These monetary funds are used to promote liberty-minded media, organizations, events, candidates, movements, and speakers. In the spirit of transparency, all expenditures are published. Patriotic business owners provide discounted products and services to Give Me Liberty Fund members. Our greatest strength is in numbers. Go to GiveMeLibertyFund.com and become part of the solution today. GiveMeLibertyFund.com 
participate in the peaceful restoration of the greatest and freest country in the world. Hello everyone, James Edwards here. Are you sick and tired of liberals and race hustlers and the media calling you a racist just because you oppose Obama's policies? Well, my friend, those days are over. After you read Racism Schmacism, you'll never again fear being called the R word. I invite you to discover why every conservative in America needs a copy of my explosive new book. Racism Schmacism has received much critical acclaim and will equip you with the key to unlock their socio-political nuclear bomb once and for all. Order your copy today by visiting the official website of the Political Cesspool radio program, thepoliticalcesspool.org. Proceeds of each sale go to help keeping our award-winning show on the air, and they make great gifts for your conservative friend or family member. Buy Racism Schmacism today at www.thepoliticalcesspool.org. Ladies and gentlemen, we're back with our guest, Judy Dollarhide. She was just uh, finishing up telling us about uh, the uh, quail and, and their egg-laying traits and, and what kind of uh, amount of meat we could get off of them. Judy, do you have anything else to say? Um, no, not really. They, they do make a mess. Um, they, they produce a lot of manure, which that can be good, that can be bad, depending on where you have them housed. Um, and it, it is a hot manure, just like a chicken, so it does have to age before you use it in your garden. But we we really like the quail. Um, we like the flavor of the meat and the prolific eggs. You know, when our chickens decide to kind of go through a molt, we always have eggs. So are our quail eggs pretty good, or do they taste rich? What do they taste like? You wouldn't know the difference. Um, there is a little bit higher oil content. We experimented with some dehydrating of some eggs. We did one batch of quail and one batch of chicken. The quail eggs, there's a little bit of an oily residue that, that kind of surprised us. And so I was afraid that those dehydrated eggs might go rancid, and we kept those in the freezer. So that might be a concern if, if someone was going to dehydrate any eggs. But they're very rich. It takes about three to one, um, but but they are very good. I don't think anyone would know the difference if you were just eating eating eggs. I don't think you would know the difference. One of the things that uh, a person has to think about when they have livestock is is how they're going to get their food to to feed these animals, and uh, what are some of the types of food or ways of growing food would you recommend on a small homestead such as an acre? Uh, that would be easy to write or to grow and uh, do on a small plot of land? Well, one of the nicest things that we've done, and and we've kind of ceased doing it because we need to to re-engineer, but, but it does work and it works very well, is, is the sprouting method. Uh, if you use wheat or rye in a, a sprouting system, you pump the water up through and it floods the, the tray and you get, in seven days, you get this beautiful carpet of sprouts. And that works very well for chickens and for rabbits. Uh, I haven't experimented on that with quail. Quail have to have a game bird feed, or they're not very healthy. I'm not sure what I could do as far as sprouting to keep those little guys going. That's We're relatively new to the quail, so I haven't experimented with them. But for chickens and rabbits... The, the sprouting of the wheat grass is it's wonderful for goats it's it's wonderful and that you just pull out the seventh day you pull out the entire it, it's almost like a bed of carpet and just divide it up among your animals and they're they're very healthy it's high protein um, plus the water that that you use is very high and concentrated in protein and the garden just loves it. So you, everything is utilized. Say that you, um, let's say we have 25 to 45 rabbits and we have, oh, six or seven goats and we have some maybe 25 chickens. What kind of, uh, or what size or amount of property would it require to raise the food to support those uh, with maybe some of the techniques? Well, with that many goats about? and that many, you you would probably want to have at least 
four or five acres, I would think, with that, with that many goats. If if you had to produce everything in a barn and, and have a small amount of acreage, you could do it, um, but you're going to have to really utilize your your grow beds and you're going to need a lot of barn space maybe as opposed to acreage space. Uh, every every situation is different, but you know, it's really nice to be able to only have to to produce those kinds of things during winter months or um as as far as supplemental feeding. If you did it strictly, if you didn't have more acreage than that, it would be eaten up in no time. So you would really have to be producing quite a bit in the barn. Judy, you mentioned aquaponics earlier, and that's something that I have uh, been looking into and practicing. And uh, one thing I like about aquaponics is that uh, if you use a greenhouse, of course, you can grow stuff yeah. year-round. And I believe there's a lot of byproducts um, besides the stuff that you would eat that you could feed mm-hmm. to the animals. One of the things that uh, is so neat about it, it's it's a fully self-contained ecosystem. It just It's yeah. pretty neat when you look at this and how it uh, works. Uh, I didn't know about the tilapia, though. I, I be honest with you. Um, yeah, I won't say any more. But <laughs> that's I, that's a big concern. Yeah, it, that, it really is. That bothers me. I mean, I, I, you're telling me that I can't put tilapia in a tank and on my own property without having them come in and regulate. That's that's crazy. I need to look into that and see about uh, getting some legislation uh, to stop some of that. That sounds ridiculous. Um, but anyway, we can dedicate a whole show to talking about aquaponics, which is probably a good idea. I'll have to set something at a later sh- show to do that because there's so much there. I looked at uh, Murray Hall- Holloman, I think is his name. I don't know if you've heard of him. I got some of his CDs and uh, was very helpful, and I, I used his system. And I know there's many of them out there, but that's the particular one that I, I had used. He's from uh, Australia, I believe. Mm-hmm. But uh, when you're raising livestock, are there any livestock choices that would be better to raising that gives someone more uh, usable uh, byproduct, you know, their their waste and stuff like that that would be usable for other things. Now, like you talked about uh, the, the rabbits having the ability to, to fertilize your garden. Is there any other byproduct from any types of animals that could be used for other things? Well, the the goats also have a cold manure. That That is a good a good source. The other animals, as far as their waste products, most everything, horses and, and cattle and those kinds of pigs, those those manures are hot manure. They're going to have to, to rest a, at least a year before they're utilized. Uh, the rabbits, if, if you're good and you've got the time and the, the space, of course, you've got the pelts that you can sell. We haven't got into that. We do have a friend that does taxidermy and He's basically said, please don't throw that away. Throw those things in the freezer and I'll come get them. So I'm anxious to do that and save those for him and to see what they look like after he's he's finished. I've I've watched several videos on on preserving the fur and tanning the hide. It it's just we're very busy with our business and there's only so many hours in the day. But but that would be something. Tanning those hides would really be something that that could be utilized. And and goats, if you're if you're inclined to to eat with the goats, you could also tan that hide and have have the leather product. A, a goat, you can butcher a goat, and you know have it in the freezer in a relatively short amount of time. Well, don't forget the lucky rabbit. Well, there foot. you go. There you go. <laughs> We've talked about the small homesteading, and let's say that we want to do a, a, a larger scale homestead. Let's say we want to, you know, 25 acres to maybe 100 acres we want to go with and uh, have a, maybe mm-hmm. a little bit larger operation. What are the types of livestock you would recommend for this? I mean, I'm sure we would probably still incorporate what we talked about on the smaller homesteading, but what are additional um, livestock that we would add to a larger operation. Well, cattle, cattle is always, and that that's the background I come from. So you know, beef cattle is is something that that's near and dear to my heart. Um, dairy farming is is very difficult these days to to get a grade A dairy barn. It's really expensive to to be able to get set up in that. So I unless you buy an existing farm that's already up and running, I would probably steer clear of of the dairy part of that. Um that's a twice a day 365 
days a year job, I, I would steer more to the, toward the beef cattle. Um, horses, I've never been much of a horse person. We never had horses. John and I had one for a short time. To me, they're, you're either a horse person or you're not. You're either a dog person or you're not. For us, horses was not part of our farm. Um, I, I know there are folks that that do very well with horses and, and breeding them and raising them, but we don't eat horses in America. And so from a homesteading standpoint, it wouldn't hurt to have one to, to till your garden or to be a pleasure horse or for transportation if you needed it, but I certainly wouldn't want to have several of them. Well, I can tell you from my experience, they're very expensive to own, and I don't feel yeah. that I ever got the uh, the return on an investment. I felt like they were more yeah. of a well, cost. Well, that was, that was me too, you know, and, and, and there's there's a lot of health issues too that I'm just not familiar with, with, with horses, and, and I would be dependent on a vet, and vets are expensive, so that that's my opinion as far as horses. Pigs are great. You know, if you've got fencing can be an issue with pigs, and there you, therein goes the regulations again. Uh, John and I attended a um, conservation meeting, oh, probably six months ago, and the feral hog issue, they're trying to make a big push for that in Missouri. The fact is we really don't have that many feral hogs in Missouri, and, and we caught something that was said in this meeting that the goal is that there be no domestic pigs in Missouri. And hey, when Judy, we can I get them, you to hold that thought? We've got a hard sure. break here, and we'll get right back to this. Hi, it's Joyce Riley with the Power Hour. There's something really fun and exciting about discovering products that make life more pleasant and enjoyable. Well, Miracle 2 soaps definitely fit that description. The shelves at the supermarket are packed with soaps and cleansers that are full of chemicals that slowly destroy our health and the environment. Miracle 2 products are all natural, like the green soap that can replace your bath, laundry, household soaps, and cleaning products. And please try Miracle 2's Skin Lotion. It's quickly absorbed and not greasy like all those other mass-produced lotions. Miracle 2 Moisturizer is full of fabulous oils oils and emollients that leave the skin healthy and baby soft. I guarantee after you discover how amazing Miracle 2 products are, you'll recommend them to everyone you know. Just call 877-817-9829. That's 877-817-9829 or visit thepowermall.com. You'll learn why so many people say it's not just soap, it's a miracle. What's so special about the Get Prepared Expo? Imagine having the opportunity to learn from some of the best preparedness and survival instructors available today. The faculty of USAPrepares.com. Imagine meeting your radio instructors all in one place. The last weekend in March. Imagine having lunch or dinner at a table with your instructors. And the cost? $10.80. Imagine having your favorite instructors autographing and personalizing your new books. Imagine buying Berkey water filters at deep discounts the lowest price in the country. Imagine buying freeze-dried long-term storage food at the lowest price in the country. You don't have to imagine. This is real. It's at the Get Prepared Expo, the biggest and best preparedness expo there is, March 27, 28, and 29 in Lebanon, Missouri. One-day tickets are $8 on the website, getpreparedexpo.com, getpreparedexpo.com. A backpack is more than just a bag, it's a statement. Whether you're a student or professional, are traveling the world or commuting to work, Teton Sports offers a wide variety of backpacks, each of which is lightweight and durable. The book bag backpacks weigh only one and a half pounds and come in solid pink, blue, red, or black. The session bags have eye-catching designs, adding a touch of style in pink and white or in black. Each is great for kids or adults who need a versatile, resilient, and eye-catching bag. 
The Professional and the Executive are sleek, sturdy backpacks with numerous uses. Whether you're hiking in the mountains or packing for an important business trip, these bags have plenty of room. Not only are the backpacks comfortable and lightweight, but they're large enough to fill all your needs. Teton Sports also offers sleeping bags, duffels, tents, cots, camp pads, and more to ensure a quality outdoor experience. Look for Teton Sports products at Amazon.com, Sportsman's Warehouse, Dick's Sporting Goods, Wholesale Sports, or visit TetonSports.com. Ladies and gentlemen, we are back with Judy Dollarhite. I am your host, Tim Starks, and we were speaking with you, Judy, on the feral pigs in Missouri, correct? Yes. There's not a very large population, but the conservation department really wants to regulate, and they want, they want to make sure that if there are any, any feral pigs, that they're the ones to capture them, and you can shoot a feral pig any time. However, they were very clear if you were to shoot one during gun, gun season for deer or turkey, you better have a permit for those, for those um, hunting seasons because if you shot a pig without one and a conservation guy was to check you, you're going to get some kind of a ticket, even though it's legal to shoot the feral pigs any time. So there's a lot of little caveats in regard to feral pigs that I don't think people are often aware of. Aren't feral pigs dangerous? I mean, aren't they something that attack humans? Wouldn't you be able to shoot them in self-defense? You would, but they would probably ask you why you were out in the middle of the woods. Were you hunting for, because during hunting season, they're going to expect you to have a tag for that. Now, if you're on your own property and, and here comes a feral pig and you shoot it, you're fine. But if you're out on government land or someone else's land, and you've shot a feral pig, they, they're they going to check you for whatever season it is at the time for that tag, and, and they'll ticket you without one is what we've been told, and that came straight from the presenter of the conservation program. Gotcha. Well, Judy, now that we've talked about some of the larger animals with a larger type of a homesteading uh, establishment there you're going to have a lot more cost you know now you have fencing and housing which are going to be at a much greater cost are there any alternatives or to traditional fencing and housing that that you're familiar with that would help one to save money and and to stay within the self-sufficiency goals not a lot Um, unless you're able to cut timber or have some kind of already brush that's in place for fencing you as high as livestock is right now you want to have a fortress and and protect that livestock because you know cattle are high pigs are high everything the the market has really exploded and coming a very um, hot commodity right now and so there's not a lot of of alternatives at least in my eyes as far as fencing no, nothing beats woven wire fence and, and if you've got pigs you've got to have a fortress and goats if there's a little tiny hole a goat will find it those uh pig panels work pretty good they them welded panels that are like four foot tall i think you can they, get they do you can get them for like 19 dollars a section and they're pretty easy pretty mobile to to move around it's not a permanent thing you can kind of stake yeah. them, T-stake them out, and then move them wherever you need to. So that, those yeah. are good options. I like them. Yes. What about doctoring and uh, medical or medicine supplies for animals? Are there alternatives such as natural remedies that uh, we as humans use? Well, I'm sure you're familiar with diatom- diatomaceous earth. That's a, a staple as as far as we're concerned with, with any of our animals. That is the best natural warmer there is. And we don't like to use synthetic things on something that we're going to eat. And we eat everything that's on our property. So that that's important. We don't use antibiotics. Uh, we just, we don't. We don't put, we're very careful on the feed that we buy. Um, you you really have to read your labels as far as chicken feed especially because almost all of it has a chemical of some sort, a hormone, a, an egg starter has hormones in it. So you have to read your labels. We feed a lot of corn. We do a lot of chicken scraps, and we're real picky on the feed that we 
that we select. Now, diatomaceous earth for animals, I've used it, and I don't have a problem using it for for uh, medicating animals as far as for worms and other parasites. I, I know of individuals who've talked about using it themselves, and that kind of scares me a little bit because doesn't that have, like, sharp uh, things that would actually, like, cut your intestines and stuff inside or cause a long-term effect in humans? Well, it's so small, it, it really doesn't have an adverse effect on humans. It, it does grind up any of the parasites, but... If we really knew everything that was in our food, we'd probably never eat anything. So it's so small, I wouldn't be concerned. Um, you're, you're probably getting more bulk and more in, in cereal than, you know, things that are ground up in our food than you probably would with diatomaceous earth. Now, there is there is a food-grade um, diatomaceous earth, and then there's a non-food-grade. So I would always air on the side of the food grade don't use a non-food grade for yourself and and we always use the food grade for our animals too a little bit goes a long way one thing that a guy used out on his uh uh, farm that i thought was kind of unique he took old tires uh stamped them full of dirt and kind of made walls with them and then put like a tin roof over the top of them and then put dirt around them and that was just uh the shelter he used for his animals it seemed kind of neat you know it was a good way to look like it offered a lot of insulation and offered protection yep. from any bad weather uh would that be a good solution you think you think the the tire situation i think i think that would be a great solution a- another one a lot of folks have used is cordwood building i don't know if you're familiar with that um have you have you looked into cordwood yes i have I, i've actually built uh a couple cordwood buildings um, you know, taking the the uh, uh, logs and cutting them up to like 10 inches long and then mortaring mm-hmm. them and putting them in there. The mistake I had made, though, is I did not uh, treat the wood for insects. And mm-hmm. I found that it, um, the insects really got into that and attacked it a lot. Um, they say you want to spray and treat the wood, you know, like spray the areas before you mortar it in because it actually gets in the mortar and, and goes into the wood Whereas if you just sprayed the outside of it, mm-hmm. that doesn't stop them from getting into the center of it and eating away. Because they'll just stay, mm-hmm. stay away from the outside. So that's one of the mistakes I had made, and I learned a lesson on that. Sure. Well, Judy, what uh, other kind of resources uh, would you recommend for our listeners to learn more about homesteading? Well, if you've got any questions about virtually anything, YouTube is a wonderful resource. Now you have to remember, you know, all the crazies are on YouTube and all the professionals are on YouTube and everything in between. But after watching most videos, after a few minutes, you get a sense this person knows what they're talking about. And you can often see the results. And several people have YouTube channels that will have a series and you can watch, you know, start to finish, whether it's a project or um, something to do with animals. And canning, there's wonderful resources. There's a couple ladies that, that I've watched on the canning forums that they do things exactly the way I would do them. And they've come up with different ideas on, on things to can. And I watched one on canning milk, and I'd never really thought about that. I did it. I did it with some success and some failure. But there's... There's a variety of things on YouTube for, for just about anything. We've watched um, making things with um, basic just junk and creating a solar oven. Um, there's wonderful resources for that, and that's a great homesteading project to create a solar oven. Yeah, that would be uh, one definitely as far as on the self-sufficiency side of things too, trying to lower your cost uh, spent for energy to cook with it. Judy, do you have anything else that you would like to uh, say to our listeners as we uh, wrap things up here? Well, it's just a pleasure to to talk with like-minded people. And um, I will say the USA Prepares Get Prepared Expo will be the end of um, March. That will be in Lebanon, Missouri. That will be on the 28th and 29th of March. And tons of seminars um, tons of vendors. It's a really great place um, for for homesteading and, and meeting like-minded people and learning new ideas and new skills. Um, I've also attended two of the Mother Earth News Fairs, and I, I'm always overwhelmed. There's so many things 
to learn and to you can't see all the seminars you can't hear um, all of the speakers but um I would recommend if if no one has been to a self sufficiency um event go and and just listen and see what what's available you can do a whole lot more with a whole lot less if you know how to do it and there's people out there that have done things very successfully um that I haven't even thought of so I I would encourage people to seek out those kinds of events uh, always enjoy having you on the show and uh, look forward to uh, having you on again sometime. Folks, we try to talk about things to help those who want to get into homesteading or self-sufficient living here on the second hour of the Stark Hour. If you have a topic that you would like to hear more about, please email me at tstarks at starkhour.com or go to our website, starkhour.com, and make requests through the contact page. And for those of you who have experience or valuable knowledge you think would be helpful to those seeking to do homesteading, please send us your suggestions. And if we feel it's a good fit, we'll talk with you about coming on the air with us. Ladies and gentlemen, may the rest of your week go well. Talk with you next week. Thank you for listening. <laughs>